recorded in the beautiful mountains of British Columbia. Welcome to Friends, Friends on, on Horses! Horses. <laughs> All right, welcome back to Friends on Horses. Um, today we've got some kind of exciting guests that uh, we've been wanting to nail down for quite some time. We're going to be talking equine Cushing's and insulin resistance in horses. And we're going to be talking about the D DDTE protocol. Um, hopefully I got that right. Um, our guests can uh, correct me and uh, introduce themselves. So um, uh, Janie, would you like to start just letting people know who you are? Okay, I am a veterinarian in um, Smithers, British Columbia. Um, I currently have two horses. We did have four. I started on the insulin resistance or insulin dysregulation and Cushing's journey when two of our horses who were then in their mid-20s, I guess, both came down with laminitis within weeks of each other and I was completely gobsmacked. It was the middle of winter. I'd never fed them much in the way of oats or high energy feed. They were just mostly on hay. And um, I asked all my veterinary friends, of course, what was going on and didn't, like there really wasn't much information out there, even at that late stage in 2008. So that started me on the journey. They recovered. They lived long, happy lives. Um, both developed Cushing's later on, but Merlin went on to live to be 35 and we rode him right up till he was 32. Yep. And Maggie, same. Uh, lived to be about 30, we didn't have a good age on her, but we rode her right up till she was about 32. And the only reason we stopped riding them is we had other horses that we could ride and thought, okay, you, you guys are old, you maybe need a break. <laughs> but they were, you know, I, I had them out here on one property and they were both running up and down the gravel road barefoot, just full of beans and full of life and full of joy. So all you folks that have Cushing's horses, uh, it's not a death sentence you know, they can recover and be functional. So that's me. <laughs> Wonderful. And then we've also have uh, Kathleen here too. Kathleen, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, sure. I'm uh, Kathleen Gustafson and I live in Kansas City, Missouri, United States. And I came to the ECIR group um, as a horse owner. I, my, uh, previous mayor who I'd had since I was in college um, had just died at age 35 and she had absolutely nothing wrong with her ever so I thought all horses were that easy to take care of so I bought this um, gelding he was 11 years old and he was kind of nutritionally unfit and my vet said just put him out on your pasture he'll be fine it'll it'll fix all of his ails so over the course of six months, um, he became extremely obese. He, was, he started out really thin and he was obese and it kind of crept up on me and I didn't appreciate how fat he was getting. And then he started to develop a crusty neck and the heavy sheath and the fat pads. And then I noticed he didn't want to uh, go as much and his feet were kind of tender. And, and it, I began to realize that um, what was going on. Now, I didn't know it as insulin resistance because nobody understood that term at the time. But I knew something, I knew the crusty neck was bad. So I started reading up and buying supplements like magnesium. Everybody says, oh, magnesium will make stuff go away. And uh, uh, just doing what Dr. Kellen calls halfway measures. She always says halfway measures get halfway results. And that's what I was up to. So I was buying all these supplements for insulin resistance. I was starting to read about it and thought I was understanding it. And then winter came and uh, I put him out um, on the pasture because it was snow covered and he pawed through the grass and came back with laminitis. So um, I called a vet and uh, fortunately it wasn't, it wasn't very bad, but um, I recalled in the back of my mind reading an article about, from Dr. Kellen about insulin resistance. So I read it, I found the website, um, I found the outreach group. They told me to start soaking the hay and, and do this and do that. So I did, I did everything and within 48 hours, he wasn't even limping anymore. Wow. So, but I also realized that I needed to learn a thing or two and the volunteers in the outreach group were really 
stressing the importance of following this DDTE protocol. So diagnosis, diet, trim, and exercise. So I implemented that, and in the meantime, um, and the reason I did that was because my vet at the time uh, told me to go out and buy the worst hay possible, which I did, and to only feed um, this horse that should weigh about 1,100 pounds uh, two flakes of hay a day. Now that wasn't by weight, it was just a flake, whatever that was, and two of them, and that's it, two. Uh, so basically the, the goal was to starve him down into uh, not being obese and then he would be fine. So fortunately, um, one of the founding members of ECIR, one of the uh, main moderators there, Patty Kuvik, uh, related a story to me about how she was given the same advice and it ended up costing the horse's life. Mm -hmm. So um, they encouraged me to feed the horse properly, uh, to give him the right amount of food, to balance the diet, to control the sugars and starches in the diet, and within um, by April, he was a completely different horse. We were doing uh, long trail rides. He was super fit. And um, I got a new vet <laughs> who understood what insulin resistance was and was so excited about the, the uh, protocol that he asked me to, to help his clients um, who had insulin resistant horses doing the same thing. So that's how I got to ECIR. They literally saved my horse. And uh, um, and he's been fine ever since. He's never developed insulin resistance again. He's been on a balanced diet for, since 2005. He's currently out on pasture full time because that's the only way I can keep weight on him. So that's my story. Thank you both for sharing your story. Um, I know before we started recording, we were talking about how there's um, you know, a lot of owners out there that are maybe coming across this diagnosis for the first time. And it's something that really, um, like um, Janie was saying, it hasn't been around for very long. And so there's a lot of misconceptions and, um, you know, maybe a bit of kind of a misunderstanding just what it, what it means for a horse um, to have this diagnosis and for their, their life and for their health. Um, I'm wondering if we can maybe just take a moment to really break down what insulin resistance is in horses and, and what that means for horses once they have that diagnosis. Yeah, Janie, you take that. Oh, you're... <laughs> there we go. Sorry about that. There you go. Um, Yes, so insulin resistance, a newer term is insulin dysregulation, which refers to horses that have high blood insulin uh, react inappropriately to any starchy or high sugar meal um, and also have a suite of other things. Insulin resistance, which I'm going to call it because that's the common term, results in horses having high blood insulin and that is a direct cause of laminitis. There have been a lot of studies on what can cause pasture-associated laminitis, and the most famous one, of course, was Pollitz in 1995 or whatever, with a gut overload. So that is a feed break-in model of laminitis, where the horses actually get sick. They have diarrhea, they have a fever, they have systemic illness, and then they get laminitis. Laminitis due to insulin resistance or Cushing's, uh, PPID is a different mechanism and it can be quite insidious. Your horse, like our horses, Kathleen, can look great or maybe just a little off. Their feet can look okay, no wrinkles, whatever, and then one day you wake up and bam, they can't move. They're laying down and groaning because they have laminitis. That is due to high blood insulin. That insulin has been smoldering along for months and something will tip the horses over the edge. A nice fresh pasture, a bunch of carrots on Christmas Eve, uh, something like that. So insulin resistance basically is horses reacting inappropriately to the diet. It is influenced by uh, obesity. Obesity does not cause insulin resistance, but obesity is associated with insulin resistance. So the fat horse is more prone. Uh, it's associated with genetics, ponies, donkeys, excuse me, Spanish horses, uh, Arabs, Morgans are all prone to insulin resistance. Not every saddlebred or Arab or whatever will develop this condition. 
thought maybe between 10 and 15 percent. Unsure exactly what the number is, but it's thought to be about that. Uh, however, if you don't have a standard bread or a thoroughbred, don't let your horse skip that because that could be the inciting thing that might push them over the edge. Did that make sense? Yeah, no, that's really yeah. helpful. Um, and just for our listeners out there, again, who are new to this terminology, um, would you mind just elaborating a little bit on Cushing's disease? And um, for those who, who haven't come across that, that term before? Yeah, and that is so interesting because Cushing's disease or pituitary pars intermedia dysfunction in horses, PPID, has long shares a number of the clinical signs with insulin resistance. Cushing's mm -hmm. disease will, can and will lead to laminitis. Fall laminitis is often the first sign that your horse has Cushing's disease. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, the horse can look perfectly normal, get laminitis in the fall, and your first thought should be, hmm. And we will get into the diagnosis part of that later. So the things they share are uh, excessive drinking and peeing, uh, fat pockets and stuff because Cushing's disease can drive high insulin and insulin resistance. Um, what else, Kathleen? What am I missing here? Treatment versus management is always Treatment versus, me. yeah, that's so important. And because insulin resistance has only recently been well understood, and even Cushing's disease in horses for that matter. Um, insulin resistance used to be called peripheral Cushing's mm. or pre-Cushing's, yeah. which is, because it's not Cushing's, it is not Cushing's, full stop. Insulin resistance is treated by dietary management and exercise, as well as trim. Cushing's disorder or PPID must have drugs on board to help with the disorder as well as diet and exercise and medication. And the drugs we use for PPID um, are to replace the lost neurons in the brain that have caused a failure of the feedback loop so that the horse suddenly starts producing more cortisol. Interesting. The other interesting thing about PPID is that it is not the same as Cushing's in people or Cushing's in dogs two totally different, three totally different mechanisms of action. Cushing's in people and in dogs is a tumor. It's a cancer. It's a benign cancer, but it's a cancer. Huh. In horses, it is not a cancer. It is a loss of neurons that result in an enlarging of the pituitary, but it's not a cancer stroke. Right. And uh, the neurotransmitter dopamine is missing. The cells that produce dopamine are the neurons that are lost. So uh, pergolide or Presan, the brand name, is basically acts like dopamine. So in a way, you're sort of replacing the lost dopamine with the drug. Um, a lot of people are, you'll, you'll hear a few people say they don't want to treat their horse or they don't want to give them a medication or I think there's something wrong with the medication. But, but basically what they're doing is extending the life of the horse by replacing the dopamine with the drug that acts like that. Interesting. Where do you think the worry about using the drug comes from for people? There's a little, it's not a little, there's a, what they call the pergolide veil. So there's mm -hmm. some depression that occurs when you start the medication. Ah. And um, that can be a little challenging uh, at first for people to overcome that. One of the ways you can do uh, work with that is to titrate the dose. So you start off with a small dose and then increase it. Uh, to a certain level. You can also support the horse using um, different types of products like adaptogens. Mm -hmm. um, APF is one of those, uh, advanced protection for formula is one of those adaptogens that seems to get horses over that first hump of the, of the start of the drug. And then it's important too to realize that uh, the drug has to be adjusted uh, because it's not stopping the loss of neurons. And this will, it's a progressive disease. So, um, and in the fall, it gets worse. ACTH goes up in the fall. So a lot of people have to test their horses and, and monitor the dose. They may be able to cut back um, in the spring, but as fall, as we reach the end of August is when this ACTH rise starts and you may have to adjust the dose. So you really have to stay on top of, of dosing versus testing. 
So probably having a good relationship with the vet that you're working with and staying in communication is a really, and a vet that's educating you on the process is probably exactly. a, an important piece of that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, well, uh, also, in the past, um, in North America, pergolide was pulled off the market because in human, it's used for Parkinson's disease in human beings. Okay. And there was a clear association with high doses in people and damage to the heart valves. So people with refractory Parkinson's um, would end up with damage, a small percentage would end up with damaged heart valves. All the studies I've read have indicated that it is dose related, hmm. that at the usual doses we use in horses, even up to 36 milligrams, 40 milligrams is still lower than what these people who got heart valve damage were getting with regards to milligrams per kilogram, you know, for their body weight. So the heart valve issue in horses has not transpired that we know of, um, but that is still uh, because the drug was pulled off the market, people are still thinking, well, it's not safe. Okay. And the, and the ECIR group is the group that got pergolide back on the market for horses. Wow. So, yeah. So when it was pulled off the market, there was this sort of instantaneous panic within the group. And uh, it was Dr. Kellen uh, and several others who started a petition for the FDA to approve it for use in horses. That's fantastic. Go team, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So not only can we, can I specifically thank Dr. Kellen for saving the lives of my horses early on, I can thank her enormously for continuing to save their lives because otherwise we would not have access to this drug in an affordable manner. Wow, wow. Yeah. Um, now, you mentioned, uh, um, even before we get into um, kind of the other, the other strategies that we have to treat and help these horses, and also, I'm thinking, I've got 1,000 questions I'm like, we should probably <laughs> talk about, about, you know, as the disease progresses, you know, what does this disease look like? Because I know there are a lot of horses out there that aren't diagnosed, that maybe people should call their vet about. Um, I'm like, should I start there? Maybe we should start there. Are you guys good with that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Catherine. Um, first of all, so we'll start with the D, the first D, diagnosis. And this is critically important in these horses because a lot of people don't understand uh, the difference between PPID insulin resistance, or a combination of the two, and they quite frequently occur at the same time. Another, another question or common misconception is that insulin resistance will ultimately lead to PPID, and there is no truth in that. So we've got data to support that. Um, coincid it, think of PPID as sort of an aging disease, and insulin resistance as a metabolic disease that can occur in young horses. Now, younger horses can get PPID. It, it does happen, but typically it occurs in the teens. Um, but some of the first signs, the first, one of the first signs you'll see is uh, fall laminitis, as Janie explained. And, um, and then the horse is treated and gets better and springtime comes and the horse is completely back to normal and you had no idea anything happened. So that was the first warning sign. Then the next year, August starts to roll around, the horse gets a little ouchy. Uh, you notice that they might be drinking and peeing more and then they get fall laminitis again. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, that winter, spring, whatever, um, their hair coat doesn't really come out all the way and you notice it's starting to get a bit long and that's just some muscle wasting and they're getting a pot belly and then fall rolls around and they get laminitis again. And so, the first fall laminitis should have been the clue to test. Um, and then, but the tip, if you look up uh, Cushing's disease in horses or PPID, um, the classic picture is, is the super long hair coat, the pot belly, um, you know, that's classic, but that's, that's way, way into the future of the disease. Mm -hmm. So that's like worst case scenario. We had a horse with PPID, and that's uh, our vet told us at the time that there was no treatment for it. So um, I can tell you what the natural progression of the disease looks like, and it's not it's not pretty. So um, 
ultimately um, she died of it, but it probably took two or three years for that to happen. So it's rapidly progressed if it doesn't, if it isn't treated. Wow. Um, there were a few pieces that you touched on earlier on just around the, some of the changes that um, owners can make once they have this diagnosis to support their horses. Um, the one that stands out for me specifically is kind of the diet piece and you talked about soaking hay and watching starches. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Okay, I feel like I'm doing all the talking, but I'll talk on this one because this is the one I know. So. Um, uh, Janie pointed out earlier some of the early studies back when it wasn't clear what caused laminitis, what the direct cause of the laminitis is. And it's important for horse owners to understand that laminitis is, in a way, it's, it's a secondary outcome. It's mm -hmm. a symptom of something else. So something caused the laminitis. And if you're going to treat laminitis, you have to know uh, what that something is. Now, in most horses, it's metabolic disease, so either PPID or IR. But, you know, you've got black walnut poisoning, you've got retained placenta, you've got concussion, you've got all sorts of things, things that can cause laminitis, including sepsis. So sepsis occurs when a horse breaks into the feed room and eats a bunch of starchy grain. It reaches the gut, uh, kills off the bacteria, causes la lactic acidosis. The gut bacteria die, you end up with endotoxemia. Endotoxemia leads to sepsis, and sepsis triggers laminitis in those cases. And that's the model that was used back when um, fructans were implicated in pasture-associated laminitis. Mm. So that story basically started out because people uh, recognized a correlation between um, high fructan in pasture in the springtime and springtime laminitis and that correlation gave the idea that maybe the fructan was causing the laminitis. So the experimental protocol was to give uh, several pounds, like five to eight pounds of, of um, artichoke um, inulin fructan mm -hmm. through a nasogastric tube into the stomach, a huge bolus of, of fructan into the stomach and you know that'll kill you. <laughs> so, I mean, basically, it, that, it's a huge gut overload. Anyway, the end result, of course, was, was sepsis and endotoxemia, sepsis, laminitis. And, and that paper was important in some ways because it demonstrated that something besides just starch could induce laminitis. But the problem with that model is, is it doesn't translate to the pasture because a horse cannot consume that much fructan from a pasture. And frankly, there isn't that much fructan in the grass. So the question still was out there, what is it? What's causing this? And ultimately it was discovered that it was insulin. It was high insulin due to the sugar and the starches in the grass. So fructan is not a sugar. It's a prebiotic fiber in human nutrition. It's considered prebiotic fiber. It has fewer calories than um, sugar. So uh, whether this translates directly to horses is unknown at the time, uh, but but all, no mammal can digest uh, fructan. It has to be fermented. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can kind of assume that the caloric content is probably lower for fructans. It's, it's an important component of the equine diet because it's prebiotic. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the reason I'm kind of harping on this is because we, if this gets us back to soaking hay and the problem of soaking hay. So the recommendation if, if we want to prevent the glycemic response and keep insulin low so that we don't trigger laminitis, we have to uh, focus in on the carbohydrates that stimulate that response. And those are the simple sugars, sucrose, fructose, glucose, and starch, okay? So on your hay analysis, that's the ESC, okay? ESC plus starch are the two components that you should focus in on. There's a lot of talk about NSC, non-structural carbohydrate, but that also includes the fructan component. So, uh, so if you just use NSC and you are told to soak your hay if the NSC is greater than 10%, then you have a 97% chance that you're gonna have to soak your hay. If you focus in on 
ESC plus starch, there's only a 3% chance you'll have to focus in that you'll have to soak your hay. And so this gets me back to many things, but uh, remember when my vet said that I should go out and buy the worst hay possible, okay? If you buy really, really poor quality hay, I guarantee that the sugar and starch will be lower than 10%, and the NSC will probably be lower than 10%. Mm -hmm. And if not, you still have to soak your really crummy, bad, crappy hay. Mm -hmm. So, but the point is, is that you can buy 97% of most hays of good quality that provide adequate nutrients don't need to be soaked because the sugar and the starch are lower than 10%. Mm -hmm. So all this soaking, uh, while it may benefit some horses with extremely high insulin and who are extremely sensitive to sugars and starches, um, there's really no reason to, to focus in on this. Now, other people will say, well, you know, fructans have calories. We have to be aware of that. Well, that's true. And so does protein and so does fat and all those things. If you want to know what the calories are, look at the calories and feed, feed your horse according to the caloric content or the energy content of the hay. But don't just focus in on NSC because um, it's misguided and we really need to stop using that term. That term is a, is a good term for plant biologists, but it's not a good term for equine nutrition. We need to focus in on the sugar and starch that stimulate the glycemic response and the, and the insulinemic response. And that's my rant for today. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great rant. Um, this um, this brings up something um, that a, a lot of people don't know or they think that getting their hay tested is out of their reach, but it's actually a pretty simple process and not very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that's becoming more and more popular in our area. Um, do either of you want to just quickly touch on, you know, because you mentioned, you know, looking at your... Um, your hay analysis, like how does someone get a hay analysis? Jamie, you want to take that, especially if this is in Canada. Canada, yep. So in Canada, there are several laboratories you can use. I'll just start off with that. Um, I use Nutralytical in Calgary because they will ship those samples directly to Dairy One in New York. A and L laboratories in Ontario also will do the same thing. There are other labs that will do hay testing um, but you need, aside from the wet chemistry results for starch and sugars, you need the minerals, iron, copper, zinc, all those good things. And so those two labs are, will do a complete um, analysis. How you test is uber simple. You can beg, borrow, or buy a coring device, a hay coring device. Mine just goes on my electric drill. Uh, every time I get a load of hay in, I go out and I drill 20 bales. Meow. <laughs> Mix up the sample in a clean bucket and send it off. Do the same with uh, round bales if you have them. If you can't get a hay sampler, um, you can open the bales and do a grab sample. It will not be as accurate and it will, it's a lot less efficient because you've got to open the bales and get in there and get the center of the bales. But it can still be done and then you have to cut them up into little pieces to send to the lab. So if you have any arthritis in your hands, that's kind of a pain. <laughs> It is, um, depending on what tests you use and how sensitive your horse is, the test will vary from kind of 30 to $90. Okay, the $90 one is the one I use. It's the Trainer 603 through Nutralytical. It is more expensive because it's what's called wet chemistry, which is a direct analysis of all products. Um, because one of my horses is a bit sensitive. You can use it, if your horse is not that sensitive to sugars and starch, you can use a slightly cheaper one because that will still give you the minerals, which have to be done by wet chem anyway. Infrared or IR analysis um, is um, fast, cheap, but it's less accurate because it's based on proxies rather than direct analysis. Mm. What else? Test your hay because that's the only way you can know not only the sugar and starch, but the minerals. If you have whacking great iron in your hay or as in uh, the west coast of North America lots of manganese thanks to Mount St. Helens basically <laughs> you need to know that so that you can properly give the amount of copper and zinc uh, that you need selenium is another one that you can test for uh, or you can look at a map and see if you're in a selenium rich or selenium core area 
Um, How did so, that sound, Cassie? Is that about where we're at in Canada? Yeah. 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 And I live in the Midwest and, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about uh, types of hay. Like people think grass hay um, is low in calcium and high in phosphorus. So you have to go out and buy a balancer for grass hay. Well, I live in the Midwest and I live on the ancient seabed of the of the dinosaur age here and and our soil is so rich in calcium that our hays actually have a profile that looks more like alfalfa. So wow. It's very high, very high calcium, typically deficient to uh, low in phosphorus and in magnesium hmm. and um, and across the world hays are deficient and I'm by deficient we mean it doesn't even meet the minimum daily requirement. So it's so they're deficient for copper and zinc, okay? And most commercial supplements don't provide enough. And so, so this gets a So the purpose of balancing is not only to understand the nutrients in your hay, but to look at the mineral content and then figure out like what's excessive, what's deficient, what do I have to correct, uh, what needs to be in the right balance because minerals compete for uptake like iron, Iron will compete with copper for uptake, so the cells really don't care which one, whichever one's there's the most, I'll take that one up, okay? So you wanna get that balanced. But, um, and there are a few commercial supplements that are have enough copper and zinc in them to uh, be uh, effective enough. But uh, we kind of talk about targeted balancing, meaning you have a hay analysis, you look at the, uh, the excesses and deficiencies and you correct those, versus um, just sort of a tolerance level. So making sure you meet those minimum daily requirement and then um, and the call it good, okay? And that's basically the approach of, the, of industry is that you feed six pounds of XYZ feed that's fortified, you plug up those uh, common deficiencies and you call it good. But the problem is, is some of these horses cannot tolerate, uh, especially high starch, uh, grains at six to eight pounds a day when they're not working to begin with. So people start cutting back on their on their fortified feed and then uh, hay has deficiencies. There's no there's just no way around it and a chronic diet of deficient hay um, is going to ultimately lead to to mineral deficiencies. And I'll say one more thing. Um, you know people go out and they buy a supplement for example magnesium. Well magnesium or the insulin resistant Horse does have some effect and because I live in an area with high calcium, calcium, magnesium compete, uh, when I give magnesium I can see the effect on my horses but in, for other people like where Jamie lives or for, for a client I have in Oregon who's I've got a hay database with several hundred samples in it, they have abundant magnesium. Their magnesium can, a horse can get like 30 grams of magnesium a day just from a day's worth of hay. So if you give that horse a magnesium supplement, it's not gonna make any difference at all. They're already getting 30 grams. So this is an important reason to, un to not over supplement a horse. Look at your hay analysis, figure out what you need and, um, and, and do that. And that's one of the, the really, I think the most important thing about the ECIR group is that they encourage owners to learn. It's not about spoon feeding people um, and just saying, buy my supplement, do what I say. It's about learning why you're doing it, uh, empowering yourself to get it done, learning how to balance, and, and taking care of your horses the best you can because you've learned a method. Um, I, that's, that's really good to bring up. I find that we like to kind of do the whole blanket statement thing. This type of hay is good. All horses who are struggling with um, insulin resistance need magnesium, um, you know, uh, but then we have to remember really the smart way to go about it is treat every horse and every hay bale like they're a snowflake. Everyone's individual. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. Every field of hay is a study of one, basically. So I have a little story about magnesium, a double banger story, if you will. I'm in the north uh, center of BC. And almost every hay I've ever had has been high in calcium, low in phosphorus and magnesium, just like your hays, Kathleen. Um, and I was balancing my hays just like you would do. I didn't take into account my well water. 
and it was very high in calcium. I know. And I didn't tweak to that until, bizarrely, the two mayors had frank magnesium, magnesium deficiency symptoms. Maggie started trembling. Yeah. We were riding her one day and she got the shakes. It's like, holy smokes, what's with that? And my saddlebred Arab may, mare was a complete flake, which I thought was just kind of her. <laughs> So I did the water analysis, sorted it out, increased her magnesium. Uh, Gypsy became a much more pleasant individual to be around. Maggie never got the trembles again, the, the muscular fasciculations. The two boys showed no difference before or after. Wow. Yeah. The other story I have about that is uh, a friend of mine whose horse developed laminitis. And while we were waiting for the hay analysis, we did the emergency diet as Per, per Dr. Kellen, which is a lifesaver for so many horses, soaking the hay and adding some magnesium as well as vitamin E and salt. Uh, and that poor horse within a day had a squirts, he had diarrhea. So it's like, okay. And then the analysis came back a week later and her hay was high in magnesium. She lives in the same area. Her, she got her hay a little further up the valley. But um, poor old Chet there, I, I gave him the squirts by giving him too much <laughs> magnesium. <laughs> and that resolved when we balanced the hay correctly. Yeah. yeah. So it's it is just so interesting these mineral balances and imbalances. Uh, and I hope Kathleen that you will share on the website your photos of Hank. Mm. Yeah. Who before mineral balancing looked like an awful tech. He was a beautiful mm -hmm. bronzy horse, but he shouldn't have been. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. I just just last week rehomed Hank to his original owner. And because uh, we weren't riding enough and he needed some exercise. And uh, he, he was the wildest, most stunning bronzed color when we bought him. And then I balanced his diet and he, he ended up being almost black. <laughs> and it has been ever since. <laughs> it was like, oh, I kind of like that bronzy color. Anyway, <laughs> she said, I've never seen him this black before. So, so mm -hmm. we're hoping to stay on the same supplementation program. Uh, with his new owner so it's so interesting you know um when i moved to this new property of mine i've got a couple of mini donkeys and i've got um a couple of horses and um i never had any of them um oh goodness what's the word um in their hoof they burst a oh abscess <laughs> abscess they all abscess within a few oh. months of coming here um, and you had talked about, uh, Janie, you had talked about water, I think, earlier. And um, we figured out that we had crazy high iron in our water, yep. you know, and, um, and resolved the iron issue. And we haven't had one of those issues since. And everyone's feet have improved. Um, and then I know down the road from us, um, most of our area is low in selenium, but there's one pocket about 45 minutes of he from here, super high selenium. A whole bunch of horses got selenium poisoning because they were being over supplemented with selenium to compensate for what we thought was this, you know, selenium deficiency that is in the whole area. So there again, it's like every property is different. So recognizing that and treating our animals very individually is such a powerful thing can really make a difference yeah and as kathleen says if you go to the ecir outreach group and get immersed in those conversations and the files as well as the website ecirhorse.org it will teach you to learn it will it will empower you to know what to look for um, it's a sad fact that manufacturers' labels are more about marketing and making money than about what our horses need. It, you know, it's just life, right? Same with human, med or human medicine, human, quote, nutrition, unquote. Um, if you looked at the labels on the boxes, we'd all be eating sugar pops, basically, because it's a nutritious, fortified cereal. <laughs> or fruit Loops, rather. Yeah, seriously. And a lot of horse bag feeds are somewhat similar, suitable for insulin resistance, it'll say, or uh, low starch. Now, often low starch in those bag feeds means low starch compared to oats, which is something like 43% starch. We need starch to be below 4% in our yeah. bag feeds. Yeah. 
So you can't go by the label. Go to the outreach group and learn what to look for. We have files there on how to evaluate feeds, which is really handy. And we have a huge list of uh, feed analyses of various commercial feeds as well. So you can look for yourself and say, oh, actually this is like 10% starch. That's gonna blow the feed off my horse. Well, we've touched a lot about the dietary pieces. Um, one thing we haven't really talked about is the exercise component um, that helps support horses once they um, have these diagnoses. Um, I'm wondering if we can take a moment just to kind of chat about that. I would just like to mention that a common scenario with endurance Arabs um, is that they're tickety-boo forever and then they retire. Mm. And shortly after they retire, they get laminitis. Not because they're being overfed, but because their insulin has been kept in check by the heavy exercise program. Uh, so we do see that a lot. Exercise, just like for people, is certainly important for horses. There is a bit of a, like there's a variety of studies on horses that show how long insulin uh, sensitivity is improved after exercise and how much exercise you need to do. And some of the studies suggest that you need to, you know, canter for 40 minutes, three days a week. I will say any exercise is better than no exercise. I saw weight reduction in one of my horses just uh, lunging 20 minutes, three times a week, which isn't ideal, but it was what I could do at the time. Mm -hmm. So any exercise is better than no exercise. Being out in the pasture or even on a paddock paradise track doesn't count as exercise. They'll just, you know, toodle along. They need to, they need to do something, preferably at a trot, um, at least three times a week, at least 20 minutes at a time. However, if your horse has sore feet, you can't do that. So put boots on them and take them for a walk. That is, that is, will help. That will help. I actually, uh, when Joe got laminitis because, you know, he couldn't be ridden. Plus it was, we had a mild winter though, after that snow. And uh, I hand walked 30 minutes a day and then uh, put boots on him. And then I got so sick of walking. I thought there must be something I can do that's making this worthwhile. So I put some harness on him and, mm -hmm. and uh, taught him to wear harness and did a lot of line driving and harness. And then what the heck, I got tired of walking. So we put a buggy to him and or a little cart and and uh, taught him to drive. So so it wasn't uh, you know it wasn't time wasted. You can mm -hmm. always develop a relationship with your horse while you're out there lunging him or taking him on a walk, you know. I must add actually the horse I was lunging was just fat, didn't have laminitis. You should never lunge a post laminitic horse because that turning in circles just blows it, it tears the newly developing uh, growth of laminae. So never, don't do circles, don't do lunging on a post-laminitic horse, and of course never on a laminitic horse. Minis and donkeys. We have a friend who drives her mini, and what a great way to exercise, and it's just, it looks like so much fun, <laughs> you know? You get out there with your mini and wow the kids and, and yeah. uh, take them for little rides, and uh, it's such a good way to exercise because I don't know, I don't think any of us could ride our mini horses or mini dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I, as I, I've, our listeners know, and I mentioned before the podcast began, I've got a few minis here, and my joy has been hiking with my minis. Yeah. You know, I've oh. got trails close to my house, and um, they all just kind of truck along, and if I want to go for a longer hike, they can carry lunch for me. And um, we'll just, you know, truck up the mountain. So that's been our kind of creative way to exercise the, the minis. That requires oh, that not a lot from me other than my own exercise. Yeah. That is such a good idea. Good job. That's, that's mm -hmm. just grand. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you mentioned, um, um, you know, exercising a horse who's recovering from um, laminitis. And, and I watched, I think that it was, was it in the video that I watched on the East? CIR group page talk that just briefly mentioned um, the importance of um, manage, like management strategies for the recovering horse once you kind of have those pieces in place. place is that something you guys are comfortable touching on? Yeah, Kathleen, do you want to go ahead on that? 
Yeah. So the, the, I think one of the mistakes I made uh, was once I got the weight off my horse, I couldn't stop. And so I got, I, he just kept getting thinner and thinner and he was doing, and, and we were exercising too. So, uh, but I was afraid to feed him anything that wasn't soaked and carefully measured for fear that I was going to, I wasn't feeding the work. Okay. Mm. So when a horse goes back to work, of course, obviously they require more calories and a different, uh, they may require more protein. Um, and I just simply wasn't feeding the work. And so he was getting thinner and thinner and thinner. So I had to kind of let go of that. And even, you know, this really terrified me to allow him to graze a bit um, after he got done working. So there is a strategy for getting horses that go back to work, uh, to, to maintaining them. And once, if, if, the, if the insulin resistance is triggered by um, just basically being a couch potato, um, Exercise is the number one way to, to bring a halt to that. Basically, the, the cells of the body, in particular the muscle cells, uh, use glucose. And uh, so when the, when, the, when the demand is great caused by exercise, the muscles are crying out for glucose. It, it gets into the bloodstream. The cells snap it up. The insulin help is the gatekeeper opens the door. Glucose goes into the muscle. And, and that demand has to be met. So when the horse is back into full-time work, you're not feeding them like an insulin-resistant horse. Mm -hmm. so, now, you're not dumping sugar into them either, but, but you, know, you have to feed the work. Yeah, and that's an important uh, message is feed the work and also don't feed the work if they're not working. Most of our horses have light exercise at best. Your, Joe was working hard, as evidenced by his weight loss, if you have a competition horse, a show horse, an endurance horse, anything like that where there is heavy exercise, then yes, you must feed that work. If your horses are like mine and they just tootle around the trails, eh, not so much. <laughs> and regarding riding, once your horse has laminitis, no riding for six to nine months. It is common for veterinarians and farriers to say, once they're no longer actively ouchy, like within a month or two, you can start riding, uh-uh, because uh, the extra weight will cause stress on the new growth of lamina. So what you're waiting for is a tight connection that extends at least halfway down the hoof, okay? And that's going to be between six and nine months, depending on the horse. But like Kathleen says, there's tons of other stuff you can do. Um, you know, go hiking. Go... Uh, Walking, go line driving, hook them up to a cart. Lots of stuff you can do before you start riding. So that's one thing that's it's hard for people to get their heads around. No, don't ride your horse. Six to nine months, but do something else with them. Short-term pain, long-term gain. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. I know before we started, um, Emma, you had wanted to touch on um, just minis and mini donkeys. Um, and insulin resistance. Um, I'm wondering if we maybe want to go there for a little bit. Is that something sure. that you can Yeah, I, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. So minis and mini don donkeys of all sizes and stripes are very easy keepers, as we all know, because that's they're designed to walk miles and miles and miles and miles and miles for the odd little blade of dry up grass. So it's easy for them to become overweight or have an inappropriate diet. Um, and many horses are somewhat similar because they fall into the pony category. Mm -hmm. Also, we're way too used to seeing plump mini horses. Way too used. A mini horse should look like a tiny horse, not like a Shetland pony. Different, <laughs> you know? Yeah, they should be slim and slim and trim and fit. It's really hard to do. You have to work on it, but that's what should happen. Donkeys are interesting because they have a naturally higher ACTH than horses. So diagnosing PPID in donkeys, there's a little bit more interpretation there. Mm. Um, however, the insulin part is pretty much the same. Donkeys and minis and ponies have another um, factor fitting in, and that is that they can get what's called hepatic lipidosis, if they are suddenly starved, especially if they're fat and they get starved. Like cats get the same thing. 
so interesting. Dogs, not so much. Cats and minis and ponies and donkeys, yes. Uh, so what happens is their system goes into starvation mode, starts pumping out all kinds of ketones and mobilizing the, not ketones, but mobilizing the fat. The fat goes to the liver and clog, in a rude sense, clogs up the liver, prevents the liver from functioning properly. As the liver loses function, the animal loses appetite. As it loses appetite, it eats less. And that is a life-threatening condition. And we have known people who have had donkeys at the donkey sanctuaries and various other places that came in fat and they put them on an abrupt diet and the poor devils died because of hepatic lipidosis. So that is important to know with minis and donkeys. If you have a fatty puff, slow weight loss. 2% of their body weight in forage, of their ideal body weight in forage, or 1.5% of their current body weight in forage, whichever is greater, whichever is greater. Like, don't starve them to death, feed them just like what they recommend for people, which all of us who've done crash diets kind of ignore. Anyway, feed them for slow, sustained weight loss and add exercise so that the calories in are less than the calories out. But don't ever starve them. Minis, donkeys, po excuse me, ponies and cats don't starve. Um, what else about minis and donkeys? Other than that, they need balanced hay. They need decent minerals that you get from balancing your hay. Uh, lots of love and exercise. <laughs> It sounds, it sounds similar, um, the, you, you, the same protocol, so diagnosis, diet, trim, exercise. It sounds like the diagnosis part is, can be a little bit more challenging with some of the donkeys, um, but, but you can get there. And then we want hay testing and we want um, slow weight loss. And it's interesting, so this uh, third donkey that I have on my property who came to me quite large, um, I did notice that he was losing weight really rapidly when he came to my house. And, um, and that was a little bit concerning and interestingly, so I come from a fitness background initially for humans. And we also talk about the appropriate weight loss in humans because otherwise you can trigger um, different hormonal responses that aren't healthy for our human systems too. So that kind of clicked into my brain. I'm like, okay, well maybe, I don't know much about donkeys, but we should probably slow this down a little bit for their health. And um, so far so good, but I appreciate, Janie, what you're saying, and it kind of makes me go, oh, I wonder if I could do even better with this. I wonder if this is, I wonder if like, we've had too much change in three months, you know? So I'll work on that. Yep. And if we all win the lottery, your next step is to test that. The, the, he's not your donkey, of course, your mini. Um, run a tri triglycerides and fat on the next lot of blood work if he gets blood work done, because that'll tell you definitively if you're in a place that you need to be concerned. Oh, what? but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, diagnosis is exactly the same for almost everything between biggie horses and minis, donkeys, etc. With the one caveat, donkeys have a slightly higher ACTH for diet. So diagnosing Cushing's is a little bit more interesting, shall we say. And for minis and donkeys, if you're at all concerned, you must run uh, blood triglycerides. That's not as important as in the big horses. Big horses can also get hepatic lipidosis and hypertriglyceridemia, um, but it's much more important in the minis and donkeys. Hmm. So something to bear in mind. Yeah, and you. Uh, so at the time that Joe, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, you go. I was just thinking at the time that Joe was diagnosed with insulin resistance, we weren't even thinking about blood fats, so oh. nobody tested, right? So he yeah. could have had. He who knows, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, I would say not just because he recovered so completely, mm -hmm. but the possibility was certainly there. Yeah. I think with Joe, it was just a, a, a mismatch from where he'd been and, uh, and then sudden introduction to really nice pasture and all you can eat, you know, it's like, woohoo, buffet, you know? Yeah. Similar to the endurance Arabs that suddenly stopped yeah. working and poof, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 
I'm just mindful of our time. Um, I can't believe we're almost getting close to that hour mark. Um, is there anything just before we bring our podcast to a close that either of you wanted to touch on that we haven't in our conversation today? I, I can't, I, when I'm working with clients, I always try to remind them that, um, that supplementation is not designed to fix anything. Mm -hmm. So if you have a vitamin deficiency or a mineral deficiency, then yes, that will, supplementation will correct that, but it is not designed to cure a disease or, or fix something unless that something is actually caused by the deficiency. Mm. So uh, I think too often people grab for uh, products on the market that they think is going to, to you know, make everything better. And uh, when you have a horse with insulin resistance, it's going to you're going to have to grab your laces and jerk them up and you're going to have to work. Um, so you need to be aware of this. The best, the best measure is prevention. Um, every horse should be on a mineral balanced diet. Uh, just because it's it's a foundation for good health and on that foundation then if you're dealt something like a disease like PPID then you're on a solid foundation to begin with and you can deal with your your disorder better so nutrition is just nutrition and uh, it's not a fix yeah I have to agree with that and I would add as Dr. Kellen often says uh, two things halfway measures get halfway results so just having soaked hay and no mineral supplementation isn't going to cut it, really. Um, and the other thing is, there is no magic bullet. There is no magic pill that will cure insulin resistance because insulin resistance isn't a disease, it's a metabolic type. Uh, there is no magic bullet for Cushing's even. You have to titrate your pergolide dose and make sure you test and get that correctly, as well as do the diet and so on and so forth. There are just so many snake oil type uh, products for sale on the internet and it's tempting. I know when my guys had laminitis, even though I know better, I'm like, oh, maybe if I bought this, you know, can't hurt, might help. No, no magic bullets. Just do the work, do the nutrition, do the analysis and the diagnosis and you will get there. Awesome. Um, um, I, that actually brings up a question that a... Uh, a friend of Mira and I's had that I should fit in here before we, we move on. Um, she ran across a product um, that was specifically for IR horses. Um, and one of, the, um, one of the ingredients in it said it had insulin in it. Now, is that possible? <laughs> Or is that or is that snake oil and how would that work? Is this an <laughs> edible is this is this an edible product? Um it <laughs> I believe so actually. I believe it was something that you mixed in with their feed. Hmm. I, we see unless unless she mistook inulin for insulin. Uh oh. if it had inulin in it, then it that's a fructan, it's a prebiotic. Um then that's possible, but no, eating insulin will not. <laughs> the list is long. The list is long. Yeah. We, I mean, we could, and, and there are some, uh, you know, like uh, things come out. A lot of veterinarians are, uh, I don't know if they are there, but here in the U.S. are recommending that people get started on a product called Insulin Wise. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've, we've trialed it in owners have come to the list and we're willing to try it and report back and have been drawing insulins and we just don't see anything that um, has an effect greater than reducing the sugar and starch in the diet. Yeah. You know, we're, we're talking about 20 to 22 pounds or 10 kilos of, of you know, food, which could have yeah. up to a, a full pound of sugar and starch in it. And then we're talking about a tablespoon of some product or two ounces of a product. And it just, you know, when you compare 10 kilos of, of forage to this little two ounces of product, which do you think is gonna have the greatest effect? And a lot of these products don't have doses that um, are equivalent 
um, or, or that should match a horse. I mean, if you look at the dose, it's hardly higher than, than a human dose. So, you know, now we have a thousand pound animal and, and we're giving them a dose that we give to a 200 pound human. So just, a lot of it just doesn't add up. Are there any brands of uh, supplements that uh, the two of you trust more than others? I would, I don't want to give the impression of endorsing something, but I would say that if you can find supplements and a lot of our members have gone, um, have, have worked with companies to develop supplements for their regions mm -hmm. uh, based on regional hay analyses. Uh -huh. uh, so if you go to the ECIR group list, you can look at a list of, of supplements that we found to be uh, good and effective. And, and the bottom line is that they have adequate amount of copper and zinc to begin with, and then um, added ingredients that may be relative to their region. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mira, do you have uh, any? Would, yeah, as, as far as supplements, the only supplements we really look for are um, ration balancers. Right, Kathleen? Yeah. Yeah. To yes, bring up the yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. So oh, the, I'm, talk yeah, I'm talking about yeah, yeah. supplements that are nutritional supplements, not let's fix IR, or let's fix PPID supplements, because there is no such thing. Yeah, no, that's right. So uh, yeah, go to um, the outreach group and there will be lists of safe and effective supplements that meet the minimum qualities. Now, analyzing a hay is always gonna be best, but if not, then, um, and the ones for Canada are listed on there too. Yeah. There's actually only two, but they're listed on there. Yeah. yeah. Do you have anything else, Mira? No, um, I'm wondering though, just before we bring the interview to a close, um, we've talked about the support groups a little bit. Um, do you mind maybe just, uh, you know, reiterating that for our listeners where they can find more information, um, especially those who may be dealing with um, this diagnosis, um, you know, now for their horses? So that we have three sites. We have um, a Facebook page where we put up a fact every, uh, three days a week. And uh, there's a little room for discussion there, but it's really hard to discuss anything on Facebook. Um, mostly it's a redirect to uh, our main uh, outreach group. Um, I can't tell you exactly, but it's a groups IO. If you just type in insulin resistance, uh, equine Cushing's groups IO, you might be able to find it that way, or just go to our, uh, our main uh, website page, which is uh, ecirhorse.org. So that's E-C-I-R-Horse, all one word, dot org. And that'll have a link to the outreach group. And the nice thing about the outreach group, especially if you're in a crisis, you can, you can write in and say, God help me. And uh, uh, one of the volunteers, it's an all volunteer organization, wow. uh, will reach out to you with a list of, of recommendations. Do this, do this, do this. And, um, uh, and they will hold your hand and walk you through every step. Um, to get your horse on a, on a path to wellness. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. It can be so scary dealing with these diagnoses, especially because things can change so rapidly and mm -hmm. to have that peer support. Yeah. Um, really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, Janie, anything you'd like to add before we close? No, I think just what Kathleen said there is, is ideal. Um, you can get all the information you need about diagnosis as well on those sites. Uh, and yes, it is important to have somebody walk you through that because it is overwhelming. Cushing's used to be a death sentence and it isn't anymore. Laminitis per se, before it was well understood, was often a death sentence. Horses were often euthanized because of laminitis because we didn't know what the inciting cause was and how to fix that. So yeah, it's scary. It's nice to have that peer support. It's nice to know that you're not the only one going through it as well. Mm -hmm. so the volunteers on that group, most of us uh, came to the group because our horses were in crisis and we stayed to pay it forward. And yeah. there are scientists like Kathleen, there's veterinarians, there are nutritionists, there are just all kinds of smart people that will help you get your horse back on its feet or your pony or your mini or your donkey. <laughs> And I will add that there are sister sites to the group. We didn't talk much about trim, um, but there are sister right. sites. EC Hoof 
is one of them um, where you can post pictures of your uh, x-rays and trims and get advice and um, and I think EC horsekeeping still exists or you just want to chat about things. Uh, we're very strict on the list about um, not just sitting around and over a cup of coffee and chatting. Uh, we are science-based, um, so everything is based in, in uh, evidence. So uh, there's lots of papers that we discuss. Um, we're always on the lookout for any new publications and new science. Um, so uh, we don't support um, advertising or discussing of products that somebody thinks might work because they have some herb in them or something, unless, unless there's evidence that something works, um, um, that's, that's what we focus on is, is scientific evidence. Yeah. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. This was incredibly informative. Um, I know I'm going to walk away from this with so much more information and, um, and I want to do a part two at some point. <laughs> Um, um, I think, uh, yeah, Mira, is, is that a wrap? That's a wrap. Well, it was fun. I enjoyed it. That was Thanks. fun. Thank you both so much. And thank you, Kathleen. Good to, good to see yeah, you. Yeah, you too, Jane. <laughs> we should do this more often. <laughs> if you want more Friends on Horses, you can find us on Facebook at Friends on Horses Podcast. Check it out for all the latest and greatest horsey news. You can find us on the web at friendsonhorsespodcast.com or Instagram at friendsonhorses underscore podcast. Like what you hear? Help us quit our hay jobs by supporting Friends on Horses. You can support us by rating our episodes on iTunes. Becoming an ongoing sponsor through Patreon. Or simply by spreading the word about our show. Have some feedback? We'd love to hear from you. Contact us via email at friendsonhorses at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. Until next time. <laughs>